All right, so we're going to go ahead and talk about death and burial uh, in ancient Rome. Um, yay. Uh, ancient Ro yay! 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So, so the so the ancient Romans uh, were not only monumental in life; uh, they were actually pretty monumental in death. At least the wealthy, you know, uh, building uh, their great uh, structured. Uh, obelisk and pyramidal shaped uh, tombs along the various roads that move out from Rome. Uh, and of course, obviously for those who are, who are not as wealthy, uh, more modest tombs, uh, perhaps being uh, buried in an urn that's halfway uh, submerged in the ground or in a, in a columbaria or maybe in a catacomb. So we're gonna go ahead and take a look at different ways that the Romans viewed death <laughs> and, of course, a burial. Now, I, I have to tell you this. You know, you've heard the saying, death and taxes, those things never go away. <laughs> well, you know, it's the Romans who really brought the idea of death and taxes together. Yes, uh, as early as the law of the 12 tables, uh, put together, inscribed in stone between 451 to 449. Uh, corpses uh, were to be buried uh, outside of the sacred boundary of the, of, of the city. Uh, this is called a pomerium. Uh, but what happened is soon after, when we get the Roman Republic around 509 BCE, uh, immediately it's time to start taxing things. So guess what? When you enter life, there happened to be something called a birth tax. That's right, which was dedicated to Juno Lucina, right, uh, who is the goddess of childbirth. Next, of course, uh, if you're a young man uh, and you're now going ahead to, to wear the toga, entering uh, that puberescent period of time, well, guess what? You have to uh, actually pay another tax called a Juventus tax. All right, and then, of course, you would think that the Romans would relent. But when you died, well, you couldn't, but those who were with you had to pay a death tax. In fact, <laughs> I gotta tell you, if you try to bury somebody or get rid of the body um, without paying that tax, it's considered tax evasion. <laughs> And you could be <laughs> prosecuted by law. So there you have it. So the Romans, they are fundamentally uh, bureaucratic, even when it comes to something like, like death So and your demise. Uh, this, by the way, this tax was offered up to Venus Libertine, uh, who is, of course, connected uh, to death. So I guess um, you could say that you were taxed to death. <laughs> okay all right let's stop the jokes okay so meanwhile okay let's talk about let's move on burial rituals differed uh in ancient rome it depended of course on one's class uh one's wealth uh for the romans uh ancestor veneration was a fundamental part of their beliefs uh, as well as of course uh uh, uh venerating the household guardian spirits uh, who happened to protect them. Uh, each home uh, typically had some kind of household shrine, uh, which was called a lares or larium. The word lares, uh, of course, uh, may come from the Etruscan word lar or larth, meaning lord, uh, since they were believed to oversee various locations and protect them, whether uh, these lars will protect your home, whether they protect a road, uh, protect a river, uh, a specific mountain, a territory in general. Uh, these are the lars, these are the lords, right? And the lords, of course, as I said before, were the, were the guardians of the ancestors of the home, right? So uh, these, I have to say, uh, the shrines to Lars were every, everywhere about, oftentimes located at crossroads. Uh, sometimes uh, some of these uh, Larium were located 
uh, at the corners of various uh, streets and even carved directly on the sides of homes, which I think is, is quite interesting. So you have almost a residual of this ancient form of Italian animism uh, that is brought together because these, these various lars were lords over different territories, even within Rome itself. Uh, you have certain areas that were protected by some spirits and some others. But however, of course, uh, I have to tell you that there is always city spirit. <laughs> so, and that was defined by the Polarian, right? Uh, the sacred uh, boundary that surrounded Rome itself. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, moving right along, uh, these good spirits were also called demons or, or demons, right? The Roman playwright Plautus specifically mentions a lar familiaris as a guardian spirit who protected specifically the family treasures. Now, uh, in very humble homes, uh, a small lar, uh, larium uh, had maybe uh, some statuettes uh, dedicated uh, to these spirits and usually located on a projecting wall niche. So uh, in most homes, at least one of the lars from its sacred enclosure was brought to observe uh, family meals so as to secure the health of those eating the food. So what happens is it's, it's dinner time. Uh, Sina is going to be served pretty soon. And so you go up uh, to your lar shelf and you take out one of them and you put that in front uh, of, of your kitchen area. When, when you're making that food, you ha you're having that guardian spirit look at it and oversee and make sure that it's all healthy because, you know, uh, the water in Rome eh, it was questionable at times, especially certain areas, although you have freshwater springs and other areas uh, heading towards the, the places where you're going to have the more humble dwellings, the water sometimes was not as, as good. So, hey, and they had no idea about uh, being protective against germs or other kinds of diseases. So the lar would help them out. Okay, as for those who are wealthier, uh, each prominent family home possessed a more elaborate place uh, set for venerating the various lars, often uh, having an elaborate shrine uh, and even an altar here in close proximity to the lars. Often uh, you have uh, the household ancestors, uh, the various uh, possible gods, figurines of gods and goddesses, uh, and you're going to have the waxen masks, yeah, the waxen masks, uh, imago, uh, which of course are connected uh, to the, the death masks uh, from the various paterfamilias, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. Uh, and obviously, along with these death masks, uh, there's a place where you can preserve the various uh, 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 accomplishments of the paterfamilia. Uh, throughout a period of time. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the, the, the Pater uh, Familias for a moment. One interesting thing about ancient Rome is they did have a very strong patriarchal structure. And at the very top of it was the oldest male in the household. So whoever the oldest male in the household, that person was in charge of the entire family over everything. Now, that could be dad, that could be grandpa, that could be an uncle, uh, that could be a, right, it could be anybody, but it has to be an older brother, depends on the life expectancy of your family, how long the, uh, the oldest male will survive, but they will be in charge, right? And so what will happen uh, is, is that they have, it is believed that they have within them something that's called a genius, the genius, that is this divine spark that gives the paterfamilias a special intuition, a special ability to, uh, to be, uh, how do I say this, uh, to perform well in bed. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it also gives him a special mandate and blessings from the gods, goddesses, and spirits, that he is, in a sense, anointed 
with this guardian spirit to guide him to do various things. So this divine spark is very important. Well, how are you going to protect this divine spark? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that you have some representation of the divine spark uh, in sometimes by way of max, masks, or uh, you're going to see in other cases, there will be a representation of like, sometimes a painting or an image of a man wearing a toga. And that represents the spirit, right? Uh, the Newman, but also the genius of the paterfamilias. You guys got that so far? So this was also to be protected very much at this altar. So you got this, these various lars, you have these gods and goddesses. Uh, and of course, if you're again, more wealthy, if you're not, if you're, if you're poor, the paterfamilias idea, while it was there, it was not as overt, you know, you only have so much uh, to fit on your little shelf <laughs> and you don't want to weigh it down or it's going to come tumbling down. You think I'm joking about that, but some of these, some of these humble shelves are just like, like almost like a brick that's stuck right into the wall that kind of stands out. But the, the, the more elaborate uh, ones, you're going to have places uh, for various masks. Now, what happens is this. When the oldest male dies, it is believed that his genius, the divine spark, moves from him to the next oldest male in the household. It makes a migration, and therefore it makes them officially uh, the paterfamilias. Does that make sense? So the paterfamilias is really a, a spiritual thing, uh, and of course, uh, as well as social. And then, of course, you're going to have ideas like the Roman emperors view themselves as father of the fatherland, and they, in, in a sense, have this special genius that goes from them to the next emperor and to the next emperor. So when you get to the imperial time, at the same larium, uh, you sometimes will have some representation of the emperor or some kind of image. And so you can not only uh, focus on uh, praying to the genius of your paterfamilias, but you could focus on uh, praying and giving sacrifices and offerings to the greatest paterfamilias of all, and that is the Roman emperor. Okay, so are we okay? Should be. Okay. Okay, we're okay. recording. Okay. The recording of the life of each uh, successive ancestor occurred uh, at funerals uh, for a, a special speech uh, full of praise were written and delivered for the deceased on these special occasions and then preserved and deposited in the household ancestral shrine. Also during these funerals, the ancestral masks were brought out and worn by actors at the funerals. Uh, the illustrious ancestors of the past then may, are made to walk in a procession showcasing to all their family pride and prestige. Because of these family customs, Romans had a natural strong connection to their personal family past, deeming this legacy as important to understanding who they were and their position to the rest of society. Now, here we're going to go. We're going to go through it now. Uh, so we are going to pretend. <laughs> this is kind of like a macabre thing to do. We're going to go pretend that somebody died. Yeah, a Roman died. And we're going to go th through systematically what happens along the way. You guys ready? All right, here we go. So if a person died at home, rich or poor, uh, members were called uh, to the house and they gathered around the deceased they gathered around his deathbed. Uh, depending on the situation, uh, the oldest or the closest member of the house, so 
perhaps the next potter familias to be, or uh, the closest, sometimes the wife, what they would do is they would go up to the deceased person and they would kiss them. That's right. But before they kissed them, they did one more, one more, one more thing, which I think is very strange, but interesting. They would call out their name. Yeah, they call out their name. And so they call out their name. And sometimes they call out their name a few times just to make sure they were dead. Then they would seal that person with a kiss. Now, if it was a transfer from paterfamilias to paterfamilias, uh, it, it almost sounds like those various stories. Uh, the transfer of that genius would go from one paterfamilias to the other. Does that make sense? But in other cases, uh, it's more of a mystical connection because you can't really be organized all the time. All right. So you're thinking, okay, this is great. Uh, you know, I mean, figure this out. Uh, it's on the deathbed. You got the, the, the kiss of the corpse. What are you going to do next? They will take the body out of the bed and they'll place it directly on the ground. What? Wait, so they call out their name, they give it a kiss, and then they put it on the ground? Well, what does that mean? Well, basically what happens uh, is that when a person is born, when a baby is born, um, what they will do is uh, sometimes with the umbilical cord not even quite cut yet, so the, you know, so the, the mom has to kind of move over, they will actually put the infant on the ground. Put the infant on the ground, the idea is, is that because it is from the ground you came from, it is from the dirt, it is from Gaia, it is from the goddess, and so you're placed upon the ground. Now, this is a very vulnerable position. And what will happen is the paterfamilias will enter into the room and will see that baby on the ground. If he picks up that baby, that baby is a part of the household. If he refuses to pick up that baby, the baby is not part of the household. It's not recognized. And as a result, there's a few things that will happen. Uh, number one, uh, the most tragic of all, is that they will somehow put it to death. Uh, according to the 12 tables and other sources, uh, if it is malformed in any way, uh, they will actually say uh, to, to take its life, sometimes by using a rock to crush in the skull. Um, pretty brutal. These are Romans, you know. Uh, in other cases, they will take the baby out and they'll expose it. Uh, they'll take it to some place, uh, open place. There's lots of stories about this. Uh, and maybe, and hoping that it will die of exposure. In other cases, they'll take the baby and they'll place the baby in a public place, hoping that somebody will claim that baby. And of course, finally, it's just actually four, is that they'll, they'll sell the kid as a slave, you know, make some profit off of it. So this is the cold, hard facts. So what will happen is this, which I think is fascinating, uh, is that as you were in birth, so you are in death. And so now it is a repeat of the same ceremony as a result of that the deceased are believed not only uh, to be put to the ground again, but it is a basic Roman belief, which we will talk about later, that the Romans, you know, believe in reincarnation. You know that. We'll go into that. Big time. And the idea is, is that that life will then go to the baby. Now, that's interesting. You're thinking, well, how does that work? Well, there's quite a few ways that this is understood, but it's, it's the idea that that uh, in many cases they believe, the Romans believed uh, that the baby receives its soul uh, upon its first breath, which, which coming out of the womb. Does that make sense? So when that baby uh, first cries, you know, uh, and put on the ground, it's the idea that the soul is coming back to them or coming to them for the first time. Isn't that fascinating, right? So, so you have this strange ritual. After that, I mean, the, the body is going to be pretty dirty at this point. Uh, what they're going to do uh, is they're going to wash and anoint the body. And then they're going to dress it in appropriate clothing, according to their special station in life. 
Uh, and then of course, uh, in some cases, they'll make a wax impression, you know, of the face if it's a potrofamilias. Uh, in some cases, they don't have to because they already made one. Uh, some of the potrofamilias are a little bit um, familiar, are a little bit like, hey, you know what? I want to look good for this. They do it earlier on in life, but you know, there you have it. Uh, but uh, after that, meanwhile, uh, what they're going to do at this point is is that they're going to move the body from the bedroom to a place uh, that's in the atrium or the center of the house in some place uh, on and put it on the couch with the feet resolutely pointed towards the door. So the feet are facing the doorway, right? So uh, that means that they're going to be going out. It is considered bad luck to face them the other direction because that means that that spirit is going to be staying there. Oh, also, before I go any, any f further, I want to mention that um, uh, they want to tell everybody that this death came about. So what they will do is they will put pine or cypress branches uh, before the door of the household to tell everybody that somebody has died. Uh, and because of that, the house is richly polluted at this time. So ritual pollution. Now, the, what is the cypress tree? I, I had some people ask me questions. Why do they choose a cypress tree to designate the fact that, that somebody has passed on? Uh, and of course, um, I mean, it's well, the interesting thing about this is that some people have said uh, that the cypress tree, when it's cut back too much, it fails to regenerate. It fails to, so if you cut off an entire branch of a cypress tree, it's not going to grow back. Unlike other trees, where it does grow back. And so, so the idea is that the cypress tree is more sympathetic to us. Because when we lose a loved one who was part of us, it's like losing one of our limbs. And so there is, this, in a sense, this sympathy between us between you and the tree. The pollution, of course, uh, will continue for a period of time. Uh, elements of fire and water are connected to the purification of which, of course. And so there you have that. Okay, so now we have this, we have this uh, a line and state. Uh, we have some various images or, or of what this looks like. Uh, so what they will do is uh, they will have the couch and then they're going to have multiple uh, couches kind of put on the, on the couch. And so the body uh, is raised up because not everybody uh, can afford something that's pretty elaborate. Now, if you're wealthy, uh, you could have it done right and have a nice platform altar in the middle of your atrium. But hey, you know, uh, if you're not, that's pretty much uh, what happens. We do have uh, images of this. By the way, uh, if you also have enough money, you can buy a special funeral couch. Yeah, so uh, it's called a lectus uh, funebris, right? And so one of these is shown in the relief of the tomb of the Hatterai. Uh, you're going to see here uh, a very wealthy depiction of this, of this uh, display in the atrium area. Uh, in this case, it is a double mattress, uh, a very large funeral couch surrounded by torches to keep back, of course, the darkness. And the surrounding atrium uh, is, 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 is covered with garlands as well as burning incense. So uh, there you have that. Okay. Um, also, what I think is interesting in this image and in others is that you're going to have those who are known as the uh, prey fikai. Who are these? These are professional mourners. So, you know, you got to have somebody cry over you, right? So, you know, and they would actually hire people to cry at your funeral. I, I guess that, that kind of relieves the responsibility for, uh, for, for you to do it, right? But the concept is, is that if other people are crying, you feel, in a sense, better. You know, it's the old story that if people are crying with you, you feel like, hey, you know, you care. Of course, you're paying them. You know, and I'm sure they care on some level. They care to get paid, but uh, the but also the idea uh, is that there's a ritualistic aspect to it as well. So there's a religious uh, concept uh, that's behind these various mourners. 
In fact, you're going to see this even in the New Testament. Uh, you're going to have uh, a story when somebody dies, and you're going to have the professional mourners, and they'll be crying away. Uh, and in a sense, uh, what they're doing is getting the spirit ready to, or and say, hey, here I come. And this person was loved. All right. Well, the person's dead. Uh, they're, they're sitting in state right there. What next? Well, the next thing is it's time to read the will. Oh, yeah, you got to read the will. They will, they will not do anything else until the will is read because the will not only talks about legacies and who inherits what and so forth, it also includes the funeral arrangements. It includes what specifically they want for their funeral. They want to see exactly how it's going to be put together. So the will is read. Um, there is, uh, there's always or supposed to be some, some sum of money and the idea is that if your family is organized, I'm sure the Romans were all organized, right? Uh, there was supposed to be money that's put away, and you add to that as time goes on, and that's allocated specifically uh, to pay for any of the funerals. Okay, so uh, the will is being read, and uh, I actually do have right before me uh, a will. <laughs> Why not? Uh, and uh, this is from a citizen of um, and uh, Mutum, um, and uh, I would just say, looking at this will, let's see what he leaves here. Um, pretty detailed. Uh, let's see, he told his family, let's see that, uh, oh, he, he wanted an, an excedra uh, by his shrine. And what's an excedra? An excedra uh, is kind of like this mini odium. It has these, has these little steps that are, are kind of circular, that are sometimes cut at the side of colonnades. So he wants one of these little, little excedras and he wants a statue of himself, <laughs> a place at this excedra. Already you can see he likes himself quite a bit. Uh, he says he, he wants the very best bronze to be used. And he says that this statue uh, cannot be any less than five feet tall. <laughs> don't make me too short. <laughs> so, so I don't want a short stubby statue of myself. I want a tall statue. Of course, five feet is not very, well, okay. Anyway, moving right along, but, uh, moving right along, he designated specific days when his shrine was supposed to be open. Uh, and um, during these days, two covers, two cushions, two cloaks and a tunic were to be brought uh, for the uh, funerary meals in his honor. His bones were to be interred in an altar of Luna marble. He also designated how close anyone could be buried to his tomb. This guy is really specific. I mean, really specific, I got to tell you. So there's other aspects here. A funerary offerings were prescribed oftentimes in these wills. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, of course, obviously food and, and bread, wine, grapes, uh, cake, sausages. Yeah, so, you know, you know, so what happens is, and we'll talk more about this, they believe very much uh, in the idea of after the dead has passed, um, you got to still feed them and give them stuff to drink. How about that? <laughs> so, yeah. And so this, this guy and a few of them are, are kind of giving what they want, the recipe, you know, hey, make sure that in death I get my sausages. I like sausages. Those are really good. Yeah. So, yeah, there you have it. Um, in fact, um, Here's some others uh, bits here. Um, uh, Asinius states, sprinkle my ashes with pure wine and fragrant oil of spikenard. Bring balsam to stranger with crimson roses. Tearless my urn enjoys unending spring. I have not died, but change my state. So there's one of this. So the idea is, is that the Romans believed that uh, you're supposed to visit the tomb. We'll talk about when exactly you're supposed to visit them. You're supposed to have a nice meal with them, which is called a refrigerium. And at that same time, as you have your nice meal by the, uh, by the deceased, you're supposed to give them some too. Now, this is really fascinating for me because they will even provide what looks like a straw that goes into the grave or into the urn and the leftovers of that, you can see there'll be like a little hole. And that's where that straw or that channel was. So that you can pour the libations in there. 
Now, how in the world are you going to stuff a sausage in the straw, right? How are you going to get the, the food in there? Well, that's another thing. So the idea is that that is ritually sacrificed or burned on the site. So that's kind of the idea because you can't, you can't, you can't stuff food down this. I'm sure there is Romans who try, you know, you know, let's, let's just grind this all up and put it onto the ashes. But uh, there you have it. Okay. So, okay. So the will is read. Now, well, for the poor, it's kind of disappointing. It's like, well, there's not a lot left over, right? So poor middle class, the funeral is pretty short. It's held at home. There sometimes is a procession that follows uh, the, the burial or the disposal. If it can be afforded though, uh, if you are wealthier, musicians led the procession, followed by singers who sung various dirges. And next, after, the, uh, after you have the musicians and the singers, you're gonna have clowns and jesters. What? Clowns and jesters moving about trying to make the people laugh by their buffoonery. And so the idea is this is a time of pain, of sorrow, but it's also a time of transformation. It's a time of rebirth. Uh, and at the same time, there are also ideas connected to the, the concept, just as, as ritualistic crying can be appropriate also, ritualistic laughter is also appropriate. And sometimes laughter scares away the evil spirits. And so this is another reason why they do this. Uh, meanwhile, of course, you know, they're mocking death, in a sense, by bringing smiles and life, right? <laughs> so, um, so the wax image of the deceased ancestors then follow a procession. And that means they're all. So if you're wealthy and you have various paterfamiliae in your line. Uh, what happens is that it's not just the mask, one person wearing the mask of that paterfamilias. There's another guy with the, with the paterfamilias before him and the one before that and the one before that. And, and they're all, so you're basically seeing a line of all the previous paterfamilias uh, marching together as if they have risen from the dead. Talking about, the, and of course, the longer that line is, hey, the better your family is, right? You know, because they've gone for more generations. So, I, so the question is, are you done? Are you two mask, three mask? Or are you like 12 mask people? You know, you know, of course, then again, uh, you're going to have to pay people, sometimes actors to hold these, and that means you have more of a budget. And we won't go there. Okay. So uh, also, uh, what will also be put in is a, a coin will be then placed in your mouth. Now, sometimes that's early on, but sometimes it's right before the procession. That, that coin is meant to pay Charon, the ferryman, so that when you die, uh, you, can, you can pay him the toll so you can cross the river Styx, uh, meet that three-headed you know, dog with, with, without any fear, and go all the way down to the halls of Hades. And hopefully, if you've been righteous, uh, go to, to the happy places, maybe the Elysian fields, right? Hopefully not Tartarus, right? So that's, that's the hope. And so you got to, but you got to pay for everything. You know, the Romans really are into money. Have you noticed that? Okay, let's just keep on going. Now, beyond that, right? Uh, if you're wealthy, this is fascinating. You would sacrifice the pig. And you, you cook it up. And that pig, the pig meat, right, the pork, right, will go to three places. First of all, and so basically you cut it up uh, in, into a thirds, right? And one third of it uh, goes to Ceres, the goddess Ceres, who is the goddess of agriculture and fertility. So you, you burn that away completely. And that's a Holocaust. They call a Holocaust entire burning offering. So you give it up. Another one third, you eat. You eat the pork together as a family, okay? Who's, or whoever's gathered there. The other third, right, is placed with the body of the deceased. And if it's, of course, and most likely it is in many cases, uh, if it is uh, a cremation, that portion is burned with it. So the, the pork goes three different places. Isn't that fascinating? So one to a goddess, one to you, and uh, one 
uh, to the um, uh, to the deceased. So everybody participates. Okay, and then of course after that uh, you're going to have a wine libation and even an incense sacrifice. Uh, women uh, who can afford it or what's called a rexinum, uh, R-I-C-I-N-I, uh, sometimes U-M, uh, which was a black outer garment with a purple border and rectangular in shape. Uh, it was double folded and then the extra material was placed over the shoulder. So it's kind of like, almost like it has a little toga feel there uh, to that. So, all right. Now, the cost to bury the dead was kind of expensive at times, as you can imagine. Uh, so how do you pay for it? Not everybody, not everybody's good at budgeting. Not everybody is going to go, hey, you know, <laughs> we're going to save up for your funeral. You, know, you want to have the mad money. You want to have the fun money. You don't want to have the funeral money. So what are you going to do with this? Well, I love the Romans because they come up with another solution. They form a funeral club. A funeral club? Well, that sounds dull. Well, not quite. It's a, it's a, it's a funeral club club but they do other things they have other kinds of social activities in fact they even will have in many cases they'll have a club funeral club building with a huge banqueting hall so you can sit together have meetings there and, and have great feasts meanwhile everybody is contributing a certain amount to the club and some people can afford more some people can afford less and then when anybody from that club dies, that money goes to pay for your funeral. Does that make sense? Yeah. So everybody is contributing uh, to this. Now, uh, these, these for, there are sometimes were fraternal in nature. Um, and again, um, they had other reasons. In fact, many of these clubs were connected to trade guilds. So if you're part of a trade, you have a club, you know, people in the same trade kind of working together, exchanging business advice and having meals together and networking. And then at the same time, if any of them die, then uh, that money goes to pay for the funeral. Uh, sometimes you had, and some, some people are not in the guilds. So what if I'm, I'm not a guild guy? What, what's gonna happen? Well, what about, what about if you're religious? Ah, so you're gonna have special religious uh, societies that will help. So various mystery cults especially the cult of Serapis, but even Isis, uh, Dionysus is another big one, right? Uh, you're going to get together uh, and, um, and have these great celebrations, worship of the various gods and goddesses, and you're also, there's contributions to be a part of that club, and that money is going to go to your funeral when you die. Isn't that, isn't that clever? So there's an incentive, you know? You got a social club, and a, and, a, and, a, and a funerary club all kind of rolled up in one. Woohoo! I don't know. I think that's a great idea, to be honest. You know, maybe we should do that. What do you think? Okay. Oh, what about the slaves, right? The slaves. Well, the slaves kind of went, hey, you know what? Uh, slaves decided they're going to have their own special burial clubs, and they were allowed to. And you're going, but Dr. Reedfeld, slaves, money. Okay, I'm going to blow your mind. You know, under Roman law, Unless you're a criminal slave, slaves were paid. Did you know that? Slaves were paid laborers, which kind of kind of changes the, the notation of slave, right? It's you're, by Roman law, you're supposed to pay your slave a certain amount. And that amount will add up eventually. And they put away a certain amount of that uh, to save up for a funeral, or they join one of these slave clubs and they contribute and that way you get a nice burial i gotta tell you there's something between you and i some of those slave tombs are magnificent <laughs> so so hey hey and, and, and there's just a gigantic tomb you're like wow what is that and it's like a slave how in the world do they afford that well apparently they're just putting all their all their money uh into these kinds of you know maybe poor in life but wealthy in death and I always find that very interesting. Also, freedmen uh, who are former slaves who are now free, uh, some, of their, some of their tombs are enormous. And I, I've even seen an enormous freedman tomb, a former slave, and it's, it's huge. 
and it's and it's its shadow is casting over a senatorial tomb. It's like, look at us. <laughs> okay, so there you have it. So you're learning a lot. Because I gotta tell you, uh pecuniums, the, the salary which you're paid as a slave will vary. Now, obviously, I don't want to talk too much about this, but I think there's some interest in this particular question. I'm just going to say, because I know that I'm going to anticipate this one, is that, okay, so there are different grades of slaves. Uh, the, the lowest one, of course, is the galley slave. You'll live for about, what, you know, six months, and then you're going to die. Uh, you're, not, you're not paid. You know, you're, you're usually if you're a galley a slave, you have been a criminal or did something wrong or just made somebody really mad. The reason why you live for such a short period of time is because, you know, they kind of uh, put uh, irons on your ankle. <sighs> yeah, and, and, and you're always tied to that boat. And the problem is, is that you go number one and number two on that boat and water kind of sloshes back and forth uh, in the bottom of that. And of course, when you get to port, they try to drain it out. But that means is that that little cusp around a little clasp around your ankle well what it does is it uh it creates a little wound right you got a wound on your leg and so that means that all that putrid water is running up and down over your wound you open you know and of course you die you know you will die because obviously uh number one number two water uh with it going over your ankle that has now been opened up because of the soreness uh, as a result of the iron clamp it's going to kill you. So the next, you're not paid. The next level up, of course, is you're going to have the, the, the slaves that work the mines. They're usually criminals too, or or un, or Christians, right? You know, push there. And these caves, you know, poisonous and the cave in and everything else. But as soon as you get to the agricultural slaves, you're paid. You hit your, you're paid a certain percentage. There's also factory slaves. Factories, yeah, of course. You have textile slaves. You got slaves that work also in the area of metallurgy, and they make they produce things, right? Ceramic slaves. They mass produce these kinds of things. They're paid, and then you have a household slave, and they're getting paid a little bit more. And then did you know teachers were slaves? That's right, teachers were slaves. And guess what? You get a little bit more of an allowance. So so the the amount goes up. In fact, it goes way up. Uh, gladiators sometimes made a lot. You know, always think about the story where the emperor, Septimius Severus, uh, he needed some money and he was an Asia miner, which is Turkey today. And he couldn't, he, he needed to borrow some money just real quick. So he borrowed money from a gladiator from Aphrodisias. <laughs> if you go uh, to Ephesus right now, there's a gigantic Mazes Mithridates gate. It's huge next to the library of Celsus. And it was built by two freed slaves of Augustus Caesar because you get more. And then of course you have the slaves uh, that work independently in town. Uh, they are just, uh, you know, they're, they're working in the area of, of, of merchants or other kinds of things. And you would not be able to tell that they're slaves except that uh, they're in slaves in name only. So these pecuniums, are you following that? These amounts can be pretty enormous because if you are a slave that's working uh, for somebody who has a lot of money, your allowance is going to be a lot. And as a result, when you give that money into your special club or association, you're going to have a grand tune. And this is, adds to the whole idea why there's kind of an anomaly of going to ancient Rome because you're going to, you're going to see these beautiful tombs and they'll say, oh, that's a slave's tomb. That's a freedman's tomb. And you're going to kind of scratch your head and going, huh? Because, oh, I forgot one more thing. A freedman slave, what's the difference? So sometimes the master will free the slave and sometimes the slave will save up their allowance and pay for their own freedom. Because they're supposed to be able to give enough where they can eventually pay for their own freedom. Isn't that interesting? So Roman slavery is a little different uh, from uh, slavery. Not, not good, because it's never good to own anybody, right? But at the same time, uh, this is kind of important. Okay, so that's why you have these clips. Okay, we talked we talked quite a bit about that. Uh, let's see. All right. So, oh wow. Okay. We, okay. So um, you're gonna have. Um, I, oh, I talked about this too. Okay. So moving right along, uh, the clubs uh, usually designated uh, ten decurions, while questors were in charge of distributing jobs. Uh, they actually resourced out, you know, how to make these tombs and and how to decorate them. Painters were selected out of this group. 
Uh, sometimes they're actual artists. So they, they work together uh, using their skills to build the tomb. So not only did, did they pay for uh, the various funerals, but they were active in building their tombs. Okay. Now, uh, moving right along, uh, what about funerals for senators and emperors? Well, that was a little bit more uh, high profile, I would say, right? Uh, than the, uh, the commoners. Oftentimes, uh, if you're a senator or you are a censor or you are a, a tribune or you were a, uh, obviously a Roman emperor or anybody of prestige, you were put, uh, you're, you're put on what's called the rostra. Uh, which the rostra was right in, right uh, along the forum there. Um, uh, and what happened is, is that um, uh, they had a lot of entertainment with actors and mimes and other performers and orations were said. Uh, you know, the funeral of Julius Caesar was pretty interesting. What happened is, is that uh, Julius Caesar, of course, uh, he was murdered. He was stabbed multiple times. And they, of course, they put his body in the roster. Now, there's two versions of the story. Cassius Dio said that the body was in full view, covered with blood and full of gapping wounds as to arouse anger of the crowd. Uh, so they made sure that they didn't, they didn't fix them up or clean them up at all. They just wanted to make sure that everybody saw how bloody he is so the people would be so angry that they would want the heads of, hey, you know, Brutus, and Cassius, right? You, know, you killed, you know, the man who loved us, right? You know, he's a father of our fatherland. How can you do this to us? So that's one version of the story. The other one's kind of creepy. Appian's version is saying, no, 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 it wasn't his actual body. No, no, what they did is they made a wax image and put it in its place. But what they did is they simulated all the various wounds he had on his body. And then they had a mechanism. And what it did is it turned his body one way and then it turned his body the opposite way so everybody can see him. So it's kind of, he's like, oh, like a rotisserie, <laughs> a rotisserie Julius Caesar, uh, you know, showing the different parts of his body going back and forth. Can you imagine that? You know, if people are getting more and more angry. Uh, so you could see that was, you know, Augustus Caesar. Uh, he, when he died, he was carried by knights into Rome and brought to the emperor's house where he was placed upon a gold and purple funerary couch. One wax figure of him was placed within a triumph arch while other wax figures of him were placed around his body. Of course, uh, wax images of his ancestors were also around him. Next, his body was brought to the forum with his couch laid on the rostra as Drusus read a eulogy. Tiberius read another eulogy to him uh, at the rostra before the temple of the divine Julius. Okay, so there we go. Uh, Septimius Severus, uh, I love this story. Septimius Severus, he died while he was in York, England. So, so by the time they brought him home, there's not a lot left of Satimia Severus. So what they did is they made a wax figure of him looking like he's sick. And then what they did uh, is, is that they had doctors announce Satimia Severus is sick. And he looks sick. The next day, they make him look more sick. And they announce Satimia Severus is sick. And after seven days, he was declared dead. <laughs> so, so that Rome could feel him passing from life. And so they thought that was effective. <laughs> that's, kind of, that's kind of creative, right? Okay, so um, it's fairly easy to recognize post-mortem images of emperors for uh, in the iconography. Uh, they're, uh, like uh, Augustus Caesar, they're shown with bare feet. Uh, what I think is so interesting is that if you have died and you are a woman, they put you in high heels. I'm not kidding. High heels or elevated shoes to show that they're closer uh, to the heavens or, you know, which I think is really fascinating, you know, high heels, elevated shoes. Uh, although there's a few examples where you're going to have a few of the, the males also wearing elevated shoes. So this kind of cross back and forth, but there you have it. 
And then in other cases, uh, you're going to have, uh, the, if you want to you know, know that the emperor has died, they will show them as completely naked, like uh, Tiberius Caesar. After he died, he was depicted as naked. Uh, you're going to have also half closed. So that, that, that's, that's Claudius. This thing is interesting, right? You know, Augustus, you got bare feet. Uh, Tiberius, hey, I'm naked. And then you get to uh, Claudius and say, let's just do the compromise. we will go half and half, you know, half nude, half not. Why not? So uh, there we go. Uh, it's, it's believed that when an emperor dies, uh, they, they, you know, as opposed to, well, in some cases, they have reincarnation for them. But in other cases, they go through what's called an apotheosis. Apotheosis is they enter full godhood. Remember, they have a special mega genius within them, right? They're just they're they have, they're super they're super genius, right? Uh, they're, you know, and the Romans see them as, as special, so that genius, in a sense, consumes them and they become a god. So you're going to see, uh, for example, the, the with the funeral of Julius Caesar, uh, Augustus, who's Octavian at the time, looks up into the skies during the funeral, and he sees a star moving forth. And he goes, look, that is my father. Of course, adopted father, because he was his nephew. That is my father that has now become a god. You know, and the, the auger next to him says, yeah, I guess you're right. And so the sign of, of, of Julius Caesar becoming a god becomes the sign of a star. And he's declared, of course, Augustus then declared son of God. Uh, and that, that, that works. Interesting stuff. So, so the apotheosis happens. Oh, I love it when Vespasian, uh, he was dying. His last words, because he knows, hey, apotheosis is on hand. Uh, he, he says, He says, I think I'm becoming a god. <laughs> As he's entering into his last breath. Okay, so of course, before even burying the deceased. So uh, you had to pay that special tax. Remember that, that tax you have to pay to Venus Libitani, right? And so this is connected to the Grove of Libitani, uh, located on the Esquilian Hill uh, in Rome, which is known as Undertaker's Grove. The grove is, has mostly cypress trees there. Uh, guards did watch to make sure no one just dropped off the bodies of the deceased and then took off. Uh, so there you go, which is a terrible thing to do. Uh, a temple was dedicated uh, to her. It was located at the very center of this grove. And here, the deaths were officially recorded along with the required death tax. So you're going to go in there and you're going to pay. So, you know, somebody just died. You, you did the whole, uh, you know, called out their name, gave them a kiss, put them on the ground, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, you know, put the cypress in front of the house. And then, of course, put them on in the middle of the house in the atrium. And the first thing you're supposed to do is march on down to that grove and pay your death tax and get it recorded. And they'll put his name down, right? <clears throat> and now, you know, with the tax. Uh, during the Great Plague of 65 CE, there was over 30,000 deaths recorded at this temple. 30,000 written down, all the names. Now, of course, a lot of people disagree. They're not sure what the name Libitani means. Some say it's connected uh, to uh, the Etruscan word lupu, lupu, which means to die. But Vero uh, says the word is not Etruscan at all, but derives from the same Latin root as libido, meaning to be pleasing. <laughs> you gotta leave it for Romans to go, hey, I don't wanna have an Etruscan legacy. <laughs> let's just, let's make this Roman. <laughs> you know, this, this, it's, it's called, uh, you know, um, yeah, it's Venus to be pleasing. <laughs> well, Venus is pleasing. Perhaps it's a little of both, for the Etruscans actually did have an underground goddess uh, the, uh, and named Alapanu, who also happened to be a love goddess. So there you are. And typically, uh, this goddess was naked except for her jewels, wore a loose fitted cloak, and well, she wore sandals. So, you know, partly dressed. There you have it. Okay, so also the Esquiline Hill, the southern part, was intentionally pay, uh, placed out of the Pomerian, the sacred boundary of the city. Remember, you cannot bury the dead in Rome itself when it comes to the sacred boundary that was supposedly cut by Romulus and Ramus, 
uh, back in 753 when they founded the city. So uh, anything outside of it, in fact, uh, was, was okay, but anything inside of it's not. But this, this line left this part, one part of the hill, the Esquiline Hill, outside of the sacred boundary. So you can actually have graves that are nearby to this grove that are not technically in the city, but right next to the city. So, uh, and this didn't violate uh, the, the, the decrees of the 12 tables. And uh, here, you're gonna have the middle-class tomb. So what is a middle-class tomb like in ancient Rome? <laughs> so you bury, you're buried in the amphora. That's right. The amphora, what, what's that? You know the thing that you use for wine, for storing your garum, uh, your special sauce, for storing food products? Yeah, that. So when you die, you know, you basically are looking uh, through your, your kitchen cabinet <laughs> and going, what am I going to bury? Oh, here, here, here's an amphora. Here it is. Uh, you know, hey, let's, let's drink the wine in it. Okay. Hey, are, we're going we're gonna to put dad in here? Okay. Uh, and dad's ashes go in there. I'm serious. Now, this is no joke. This is what they would do. Uh, sometimes you have more money, you buy a nicer one, you know, uh, has nice decorations and so forth, but just being put into the, into the ground. And then what happens is they stick it halfway in the ground, or in some cases, all the way up to the lip of the, uh, the pottery of, of the piece, so that there's something, and then you, you lock it up, uh, and then they put a connecting pipe in it. For what? For pouring the libations. You pour the libation. So you see these all over. So the ashes are inside, corked up uh, in, in an amphora. So literally. And then, of course, they, they, they pour uh, the various uh, wine to, uh, to, to nourish the, the body. Also, you're going to have in the area many columbaria. They're located on the Esquiline Hill as well and, and around all over Rome. Uh, the columbaria were, became, were very popular during the time of Augustus. Uh, they were very great, grand uh, structures that were built underground. <clears throat> and they had, uh, you know, sometimes they were square in shape, sometimes they were circular, and they're placed deep into the ground. And you have all along the, the, the all around it, you have niches, and in each niche, you have an urn. Now, how do you expand these things? Sometimes they built these things round or, or, or square. How do you expand these things when more people die? You just keep digging further and further down. And that way you can expand. So you can't expand up, but you can certainly uh, expand down. This is a columbaria. Uh, and the, the columbaria of Augustus contained as many as 3,000 slaves. 3,000 slaves in one columbaria, right? Barium. Uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, you have columbaria connected to uh, to various clubs. We talked about that. Um, what were what were considered the best spots? The best spot is you don't want to have a a bottom niche and you don't want to have a top niche. You want to be somewhere uh, in the very middle. Uh, so uh, these, of course, later on. Uh, when they're no longer used columbarium, uh, they became people's uh, special wine cellars, <laughs> as you can imagine. Uh, and of course, uh, even one was turned into a restaurant in Rome called the Historia, Historia Antica Roma. All right. Now, what if, uh, what if you're not claimed? You know, what, ha what happened if, you know, nobody, nobody loved you? What happened if nobody loves you, right? Uh, you're thrown into what's called uh, a a putaculi. A putaculi is a potter's field. It's like putaculi, right? So you're thrown into a potter's field. Uh, one of these was located at the at the eastern end of the Esquiline Hill in Rome, uh, as I said. Uh, so that means the poor that nobody claimed, uh, the the condemned uh, criminals and slaves were all dumped there. And by the first century BCE, slaves received better treatment. And they were not put there, but at first they were there. And so basically uh, this consists of a series of vaults, about 12 feet on each side, and were about 30 feet deep, all which were open to the sky. Get this. And so what they would do is they dump the bodies into this hole. And they wouldn't, they, you know, they'd be covered a little bit, but that's it. And then they dump more bodies on top of it. 
and then more bodies. And so there's very much noxious smells, right? Would come right because they're you basically have exposed bodies laying on top of each other. But don't worry, every now and then they would push their bodies further down and they put more bones on top of them. And that's how they dispose of the dead. Uh, Augustus, uh, he wanted to stop this practice. And so the one that was by the Escaline Hill, uh, this potter's field, he turned it into a garden and poured fresh soil above it uh, to try to forget its grim past. Now let's talk about uh, the, well, you, you got to have people to do the death work, right? So the undertakers in Rome were called uh, the libitonerai. The libitonerai, tonerai, excuse me, uh, were obviously connected to this grove of Venus. They were uh, especially uh, trained uh, to, uh, how do I say this, uh, to, um, to negotiate uh, with various peoples about their graves, right? Uh, and also, uh, you got to pay them. Who's going to gonna pay the tax to? You're going to pay it to the undertaker. But wait a second. Do you mean the undertaker is not going to be the one who, uh, who does all the preparation? No, that's somebody else. They're called the uh, polen katoris. The polen katoris are those who are trained to wash and prepare the bodies, if you want to do it their way. Unless you want to do it yourself at home, which is, is, is an option. And then those called the designators, I like that name, the designators were put in charge of other, they're put in charge uh, of the other undertakers and were, were also those uh, who also um, uh, dealt with people who are of more status uh, at the same time, uh, who actually dug the graves. Though Those are known as the Fasaurus. Uh, and uh, so those who are the grave diggers and meanwhile, those who burned the body were called the Eustorus. So you got you got kind of a bureaucracy here at, at, the, at the Venus Grove. You got those people are negotiating the prices. You got those people are preserving the bodies. Uh, you got you got you got those who are giving special treatment to certain people, uh, especially if you're wealthy. You know they 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 are in their own little area. And then of course you got those if you want to go for inhumation, a body burial. You got those. If you want to go for cremation, you got those. How's that, right? So pretty efficient. So some, sometimes uh, people decided not to do the home version of the burial and they'll let the Venus uh, group do it for you. It's like the Neptune Society, I don't know. Okay, there's all these gods, who cares, right? Okay, moving right along. However, I would not want to be a mansip. What's a mansip? A mansip well, uh, the word actually means a subcontractor. <laughs> and what do they do? Uh, they have the unpleasant duty of going about Rome uh, and collecting the unclaimed bodies. You know, you know, kind of like uh, you have when it comes to animals here, you know, animal control, they look for, you know, a deceased well, cat or dog or something, you know, on the road. Uh, you had those because in Rome, uh, people's lives were not as precious as they should be. And so you actually had a group of people going about Rome, uh, picking up dead bodies, finding dead bodies, because there happened to be so many of them to be found. So there you have it. Uh, Romans uh, both cremated and buried their dead. So let's go through that just a little, little bit. Uh, so at first, uh, the practice was inhumation, which is body burial. And this was actually, this idea was so deeply entrenched uh, for the Romans, who were very traditional, that even when they, many of them adopted cremation, they had to have some part of the body that would be preserved. Something. And so what they would do, I know this is, I'm sorry. What they would do is before they cremate the body, uh, they cut off one of the fingers or they cut off one of the toes, or they cut off something, some other part of the body. And so then they do the cremation and then they throw the finger or they throw the toe uh, into with the ashes. Does that make sense? So, so that way, technically, not all uh, is cremated. Cremation also uh, at first and even later on was pretty costly, you know, you know? but the problem is, is that 
it was also costly to do a burial of the body because that took up more physical space. So you, you can't win, can you, right? Okay, moving right along. Uh, you're going to have uh, even some of the wealthy decided, hey, I'm not going to go for cremation. I'm going to want to be buried with all pomp and circumstance. For example, uh, Papea, second wife of Emperor Nero, uh, she was embalmed rather than cremated. So you could see, you know, you could see her, uh, you know, in her body. And then, and we also, they also had some ideas of mummification. Uh, so in 1964, they found uh, a mummified body of a seven or eight year old girl uh, that was found in the outskirts of Rome. She's very well preserved. She suffered from rickets and died of tuberculosis. How's that for a body that was well, well put together? She's wearing her jewelry, including her necklace earrings, a finger ring. Uh, she's even buried with her toys, a miniature pots, and an ivory jointed doll. Uh, during the Renaissance, two bodies of Roman women were discovered who were likewise mummified and wore painted uh, face masks. So, so you didn't have to go, uh, you don't have to go through, uh, you know, just you know, body burial was also considered dignified. Certain days were designated to honor the graves of the deceased. Uh, you're going to have initially uh, you have what's called the nine days of sorrow, which was observed after the person's death. Uh, if the body was cremated, the flames were doused with water or wine, and then the ashes need time to dry. So it took about nine days to fully dry the ashes. You guys wanted details? I'm giving you details, <laughs> every detail possible. Uh, so there, on the last day of the observance, the sacrifice to the deceased was made. Uh, and then, of course, um, uh, that's the time is over. But if you were a spouse or a close family member, you had to remain in mourning for the next 10 months. Next 10 months. Uh, another day that was important was the departed's birthday called the Deis Natalis. It was always revered. Okay, there was another time. And, of course, that's where you go on their birthday. You go there with, uh, you have, a, you spend time, you have a refrigerator, you have a nice meal with them. Uh, there was also uh, a time called the, the um, uh, excuse me, I'm talking so fast here, right? Uh, uh, you're going to have also the uh, February 13th to 21st, you're going to have the Feast of Parents called the Parentalia, and where you visit specifically your parents uh, during this period of time, right there. Uh, uh, in fact, the last day of this public festival is known as the Peralia. Uh, during this day, magistrates uh, did not wear the toga and temples were closed and absolutely no weddings, right? And then, of course, you have another celebration around May called the Rosalia, in which it's the Feast of Roses, where it's expected for you to go uh, to the grave and put roses by the graves. The roses were, were pretty, uh, pretty much very closely associated with the dead. Of course, um, not all the dead were, were buried promptly uh, or properly, and sometimes they were forgotten. So what happens when that happens? Well, they become ghosts, almost like the hungry ghost concept where they will, will haunt about various places. So on May 9th, on May 11th, and on May 13th, they had what's called the Lemuria. And this is when the unsettled and sometimes malevolent dead, known as lemurs uh, or larvae, ooh, uh, used to prowl around your house. Ovid said they appeared around the time of midnight. The worshiper is supposed to, uh, who is the head of the household, uh, is supposed to, uh, during these days, is supposed to uh, make the sign with his thumb in the middle of his forehead then wash his hands from a clean spring water. And then he was to take black beans, there's beans again, and throw them with an inverted face saying nine times, Hake ego mito, his redemo misque miusque fabis. These I cast with thee, I redeem me and mine. And he says that over and over again. These I cast with thee, I redeem me and mine as he's throwing these black beans, and it's believed, as he does this, the ghost will try to uh, grab and follow after these beans. 
He then touches the water afterwards. And then the rest of the family goes around and they bash bronze pots together. It sounds like a fun thing for all the kids, right? Hey, we're having Lemuria. It's like, hey, I'm going to grab, I'm going to grab my favorite pot. Uh, and let's have some fun. Okay. As I met, mentioned before, um, you have what's called a refrigeria. Uh, these are the uh, meals, the family meals that are that that, that that people go by the graveside. I know that we have recently had Day of the Dead. I want to tell you that that kind of tradition is all around the world. And yes, they had this in Mesoamerica, but they had this also in ancient Rome. Uh, not only are you supposed to go to that tomb, uh, you know, on the you know on the day of their birth, you're supposed to go to that tomb also on the day of their death, and of course you're supposed to go there up to their tomb again uh, to put roses on Rosalia. You know what? When it comes to all the Roman holidays, you at least will be visiting that tomb about five or six times beyond uh, your own times that you want to visit them. Okay. When you look at the iconography, take a look at the iconography. It tells so much about the person's beliefs and social status. Uh, but you're going to see what are called gorgons on the sarcophagus. You know, the, you know, the medusas, right? They're, they're like gargoyles in a church, right? They're intended to ward away any evil by their very fearsome presence. So they scare away any evil spirits. Uh, the gorgons uh, are connected uh, to the idea of also the moonlight. So they are a light bearer. It's interesting uh, because there's a story where it is believed that, that while blood was taken from the white side to the left side of the Gorgon's face led to instant death, blood taken from the right side of the face could actually bring someone back to life so that the Gorgon could also represent the renewal of life. So death as well as light. Meanwhile, you're also going to see lions on the sarcophagi. These lions represent the sun. So the gorgons represent the moon. The lions represent the sun right there. And you're going to have the serpent. When you see a serpent on this, this, this connects to the idea of immortality because the shedding of skin, right? You're going to see the god Dionysus. The god Dionysus, of course, is the dying, resurrecting god. And so that connects to the idea of life, death, and resurrection, right? Uh, also, it's kind of cute. Uh, you'll see Dionysus also shown uh, to be awaking um, uh, Eridani. Now, Eridani, it's interesting, in order to marry her. According to various versions of this myth, when Dionysus uh, was with his sea women uh, uh, and fought against the Argives, uh, Eridani, the daughter of King Minos of Crete, was slain and turned to stone by King Perseus. But Dionysus would not permit his love to be lost, and so descended into the underworld, brought her back, and turned her into a goddess. Isn't that great? She becomes a goddess. So you can see why that image on a sarcophagus would bring hope. It's like, well, if Dionysus could do that to his beloved, he could certainly do that for me. Also, of course, he did save his mother, uh, Semele, as well. <laughs> so um, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of prolific, right? You got, you got Cupid, too. Cupid uh, is, is shown quite a bit, oftentimes on children's tombs. But you're going to also see Cupid with the goddess Psyche. Uh, and, of course, many people will say that Psyche represents, of course, the soul. That's a representation of the soul. And Cupid uh, is kissing, in a sense, the soul. The, the goddess psyche which is kind of kind of cool because the romans have another idea and that is they believe that oftentimes when somebody dies their soul takes the form of a butterfly so when you see a butterfly flying about that could be the soul of of the deceased going about okay moving right along you have wing victories represents victory over death. Uh, you have theater masks, of course. You got Serapis. Uh, there's interesting things there. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, there was a period of time where there's Egyptomania. Uh, I got to tell you the tombs of Augustus. Uh, tomb Augustus looks like a gigantic cigarette, but let's keep moving. Because um, uh, I, I know we're running out of time. 
um, but I want to say a, a few other things here. Um, let's see, go here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I want to get to the, got some good stuff going on here. Oh, I want to mention also uh, in many of these tombs, especially like the Columbaria, uh, they, I know a lot didn't survive to this date, but the ones that are preserved, they found that they actually put portraits of the deceased by some of these niches where the urn was. So you can see what they look like. And, and they had bucolic or, or beautiful uh, landscapes that were painted to make it look, uh, you know, like a, an ideal kind of place uh, to be. Uh, in fact, um, and so, in fact, some of these, these images of garden landscapes, people, when they die, you know, whether it be in a columbarium, they're being placed there or a tomb, they loved gardens, absolutely loved gardens. And so uh, you're going to see, for example, the tomb uh, of, of Via Porta Nice portrays people relaxing in a garden, having picnics, playing a ball game. There's even a boy riding, guess what? Guess what? A Roman version of a scooter. <laughs> so, you know, uh, tombs, uh, you know, were oftentimes made into seats for people uh, who are wayfarers. So, you know, it's like, you're, you know, they, they place these chair, these, these throne-like tombs. So along the road, if you're really tired and weary, uh, the ideas are still giving in the afterlife. They're giving you a place to sit. Isn't that beautiful? you know, so that are still useful. Uh, furthermore, uh, rabbits, by the way, are symbols, uh, eating grapes especially, are symbols of not only life after death, but a multiplicity of blessings after death. So, and that's, that's another beautiful display. Um, uh, there's different kinds of burial grounds. You have the Islo Sacra, uh, which is near uh, Ostia, and here you have rows of houses of the dead, entire insulae, entire blocks, uh, you know, with opus rectilium. And so people are living in little houses. So you can walk through uh, this area. It's about 40,000 square meters. It's just a gigantic area. There's another one uh, tomb area uh, at Ostia uh, where the idea is, is that what they will do is they'll have high walls around the tomb. And the only way to get into the tomb area is with a ladder. And then inside you have the urns placed along the walls. So that way it keeps uh, the privacy, okay? Now Romans uh, very much feared uh, people uh, breaking into these tombs and taking things away because they really did believe that somebody, that spirit lived in these houses and they made them look like houses. They had, they have roofs, they have windows, they have doors, they even have gutters sometimes put in there. They look like this little houses. And these are, so the idea is that somebody buries their own dead in your house or steals things. It's like somebody uh, uh, is occupying your home in real life or their thieves are stealing from you. Does that make sense? So you gotta protect them. So they have all these different inscriptions that talk about protection. I'm going to go, of course, a little bit over because we started late. So if that makes any sense. So the, as I said before, uh, so they had these inscriptions talking against violation. I want to read a, a few of these, right? Um, here it is. Um, one, uh, one tomb, it says as follows. Gaius Tullius Hesper had this tomb built for himself as a place where his bones might be laid. If anyone damages them or removes them here, I wish him that he may live in physical pain for a long time and that the gods of the underworld may not admit him when he dies. <laughs> okay, that's quite a curse. So I guess, I guess I'm not going to put another body in that tomb. What do you think, huh? That kept them away. Uh, by the way, you can always tell uh, the tombs of free people as opposed to uh, uh, freed slaves. Because, uh, of course, if you're, if you're a slave, sometimes you have one to two names, occasionally three. If you're, if you're free, typically you have three names. But if you know, if they're a freed person who is a, basically a former slave who's now a freedman, beyond in life where we wear a freedman's cap, which is like this interesting red cap that you have to wear after you're freed because you don't want somebody coming around saying, hey, slave, are you going to do this? And you're like, hey, I'm wearing a freedman's cap here. <laughs> you can't order me around, right? Uh, 
But beyond that, uh, what will happen is, is that they will put an, uh, a L um, uh, in the name and that means libertas. So, so you can always know if you see a name and you see an L standing by itself, that's a libertas. I'll tell you exactly where they put it. So if you have somebody uh, who is M. Tullius Cicero Zosimus, if they're a freed person, they're M. Tullius Cicero L. Zosimus. So they put the L right before the final. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. Well, uh, I know time is up, but I want to end on some inscriptions. I want you to hear, as opposed to me talking about the Romans and death, what I want to do is I want you to hear for yourself what the Romans said about the dead on their tombstones. You guys ready? Here it is. Okay. This first one uh, is a funerary inscription. Uh, and her name is Blandinia Martiola. It was set up by her husband. And it goes as follows. To the eternal memory of Blandinia Martiola, a most faultless girl who lived 18 years, nine months, five days. Um, Pompeius Catasus, a Sequarian citizen, a plasterer, dedicates it to his, his wife, who was incomparable and very kind to him, who lived with him five years, six months, 18 days, without any shadow of fault, this memorial, which he had erected in his lifetime for himself and his wife, and which he consecrated while it was still under construction. You who read this, go bathe in the baths of Apollo, as I used to do with my wife. I wish I still could. Oh, kind of sad, huh? God, okay. And your picture is poor guy. It's like, oh, you know, it's, it's over, right? Another one goes uh, to another wife. Uh, it's a stranger. I have only a few words to say. Stop and read them. This is the unlovely tomb of a lovely woman. Her parents named her Claudia. She loved her husband with all her heart. She bore two sons. One of these she leaves here on the earth. The other she had already placed under the earth. She was charming in speech, yet pleasant in proper manner. She managed the household well. She spun wool. I have spoken. Go your way. Hmm. Here's a few others here. Uh, Lucius Aurelius Hermia, the husband of Aurelia, uh, made an inscription. He, she, he says, Lucius Aurelia Hermia, freedman of Lucius, a butcher on the Verminal, she who preceded me in death, was my one and only wife. <laughs> Through these, huh? Uh, sorry, chaste in body, with a loving spirit. She lived faithful to her husband, always optimistic, even in bitter times. She never shirked from her her duties. Let's let's let's, let's, let's have some for her husband now, right? We we did we've done three wives. Well, here we go. Okay, so a wife wrote. Furia spes. Freed woman, a Sopronius Firmus, provided this memorial for her be dearly beloved husband. When we were still boy and girl, we were bound by mutual love as soon as we met. I lived with him for too brief a time. We were separated by a cruel hand when we should have continued to live in happiness. I therefore beg, most sacred Manes, that you look after the beloved one I have entrusted to you and that you will... Uh, be disposed and very kind to him during the hours of night so that I might see him and so that he too may wish to persuade faith to allow me to come to him softly and soon. Okay, we get through these. Okay, we have just a few more. And uh, uh, you also have, of course, uh, in some cases, the voice of the deceased speak through these inscriptions. Um, you have, uh, for, for example, I was called while alive Aurelia, Philomatium, a woman chaste and modest, unsoiled by the common crowd, faithful to her husband. My husband, whom, alas, I have now left, was a fellow freedman. He was truly like a father to me. When I was seven years old, 
he embraced me. Early marriage, right? Uh, now I am 40 and in the power of death. Uh, through my consistent care, my husband flourished. Uh, there are, of course, uh, in inscriptions to lost sons and daughters taken away too soon. Uh, one, of course, to the child, uh, uh, Magnelia. Uh, oh, serene peace of the inhabitants of the underworld, and you renowned spirits of the pious who dwell in the sacred areas of Erbius, conduct Magnelia uh, through the groves and the Elysian fields directly to your resting places. She was snatched away in her eighth year by an inopportune fate while she was enjoying the time of tender youth. She was beautiful and sensitive and clever, elegant, sweet, and charming. Yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Far beneath her, beneath her years. Uh, this unfortunate child who is deprived of her life so quickly must be mourned with perpetual lament and tears. Okay, let's get to the last one. I can't handle this anymore. Uh, uh, and of course, some uh, just simply wrote uh, something to be profound. And I'll end on this note uh, uh, from a, a, a certain one from Padua uh, in Italy, uh, leaving no name and goes as follows. I was not, I was, I am not, I care not. Thank you. There we go. All right. So covered quite a bit, right? I think we, you know, there's there's more I could have could have said, but I figured, uh, and on those, and, you know, those, uh, those, um, those inscriptions, because it kind of tells all that these people, you know, they once lived and walked this life. They had, you know, they had hopes and dreams, uh, just like we do, and um, and they 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 loved those who were close they were close to and they mourned uh, just as much as we have mourned i know a lot of people say that uh you know you know uh the ancients don't understand love you know they have this idea of courtly love bringing in the idea of romance and true love by the way i've read enough inscriptions and sources from ancient rome they just love just like the rest of us and weep just like the rest of us so yeah they're all human anyway any questions? Yes, Craig asks, uh, did the slaves live independently like modern mortals? And the answer to that is many slaves uh, lived completely independently. It depends on the slave. If you were a, uh, your, your master lived in, in, in the country and he had business in town, uh, not only did you live in town, you were provided your very own apartment, your own special salary, uh, an ad in addition to the pecunium to, to pay the various expenses of the city. Uh, so the answer is absolutely yes and very common. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, in, in fact, there's a work called the Satyricon. Uh, which is like a novel from the first century that talks about that. Yes. Um, these uh, inscriptions that you read, yes. Um, are these quite common? Yes. Yes. The reason why I ask, I wonder, is, is there a, uh, I'm not sure I asked the question, I'm sorry, just thinking about it somewhere. Um, He's asking, are, are these inscriptions like this that I just read, are they common or not? And I just said, yes. That said, is that somebody's job? Somebody who consults, does a family consult a, uh, a writer on how to uh, write these? Okay, so does somebody consult a writer on how to write these? And the answer is, it depends. So obviously, you're going to have somebody who is employed who will be carving this in directly. Uh, so you're going to have you're going to have that aspect. So, but it depends. Sometimes you have those who are literally carving them in, and you can tell by the style. But I, what I, one thing I want to bring up, because this is interesting, because this happens at Ephesus, is that you're going to have many uh, of the tombs, funerary inscriptions, you're going to have a formula to it. Just like we, unfortunately, we have in many of our graves today, a formula in loving memory, a tribute to. Right, right. And, so, and so there's evidence that uh, many of these these were kind of 
uh, mass produced. You know, you you love you, you love this person, you do okay, and you know, and um, they'll go ahead and put it together. But there's other people who really felt very deeply about their loved ones, and they say, no, I want a special custom one. But these custom ones are more common than you would think. Uh, in, in many cases, they just you know they wanted to be known. And remember, and again, at Ephesus, you're going to see uh, that, uh, you know, they're going to say some pretty kind and sweet things. But like I said, it depends um, on, on a few things. It depends on uh, who's the one who is carving it, uh, how much money you have, and who you know. Uh, if you're connected to one of these uh, trade groups, uh, of course, you know, you have the money to pay for all the extra carving, right? But I also want to mention the fact that when it comes to the sarcophagi, uh, they, they actually, in many cases, they mass produce these ahead of time. So they mass produce these. Uh, and uh, see, so we have we have discovered a sarcophagi that nobody was buried in them. And they were just waiting uh, exactly. for somebody to come along. And also, uh, another thing they like to do is that some of the sarcophagi, you have the image of the person who's deceased. Now, one interesting thing is, is that if, if, if there's a, a couple that's buried together, you always know uh, who who died first because the other one is oftentimes carrying uh, their bust or their portrait. But what, but what a fascinating part is, is that we have found some of these that are supposed to have images of their faces on it, we have found them un unworked. So we just have the unworked stone that's ready to have it custom made to have that person's face put on there. Wow. So, so that's how things are, yeah. And even enough stone uh, to put the hair and everything else. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. And, and, and yes. those uh, uh, surviving uh, formula, I guess I'll call mm -hmm. them that, yeah. um, are they known to change, say, from century to century? Yes, they do change. Uh, the formula change from time to time. And in many cases, uh, beyond uh, uh, if there's a date on them, that's how we know, uh, you know, when they're, you know, stylistically when they're made. Because uh, sometimes they're re refashioned over, in, in a sense. Oh, which which brings up a, a, another. Yeah, no, we're fine. Okay, so I was going to jump onto another another topic, but yeah, yeah. So they change over a period of time, um, but um, but there's certain ideas that still remain remain the same. I, I I found that the ones from the first century BCE, first century CE, and second century CE are the ones that are the most unique and the most personalized. So I think that's interesting. And I think it's, the other part is we have to realize the Roman lifespan was longer at that time and got shorter afterwards. So it looks like they almost had more time to appreciate them and get to know them. I don't know. Uh, so we learn a lot about people uh, just by uh, just by reading these tombstones. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. And to add to that, uh, is there any uh, formulae or, or style that uh, can be associated with the type? of internment, like cremation versus inhumation? Okay, is there, a, is there a difference in type when it comes to the inscription? Yeah. Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, if, you know, if, if, it's, if it's, for example, if it is placed in a, um, uh, a well, if it's placed in an amphora, and, you're, and, and of course it's, it's buried halfway in the earth, uh, you're not gonna be able to put too much on that particular yeah. pot. So there's a limitation of, of space. Does that make sense? Yeah. But if you're put, uh, in, in, if you're put into a tomb, uh, in, a, in a columbarium, uh, you're gonna have you're gonna have that that. Sometimes what they'll do is they have the, the niche. You you put the urn in there and they'll cover it over, and then they'll have the inscription. Unfortunately, we've lost a lot of these because people think they're, they're they put gold and other kinds of things in there during the Middle Ages, so they they, they just break them, and so we lose the covering. Right. And, and also with the catacombs, the same thing, you know, the catacombs, uh, what they would do is they, you know, these are placed right into the wall and they just basically uh, cover you with a shroud. They put you in the shelf and they cover it over and then, and then they have a lot of room to write something. But unfortunately, they, many of these are broken. So, so a lot of these inscriptions depends on how much room you have on the actual uh, tomb uh, and or what holds your, your body or ashes, your sarcophagus. Does that make sense? So, yeah. so it is about, you know, how much material you have. You know, you're not gonna be able to stuff a lot 
Uh, like I said, if you're, you know, I don't know if we'll answer. Does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's materially based. But chances are that if you really, you know, if you really cared, right, <laughs> you get a bigger pot. Oh, I'm joking. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I was wondering because I, I remember reading somewhere, it might have been Boingy's book, I don't recall. Uh, cremation was very popular during uh, Augustus' reign. Yes. So I wonder if they were uh, less uh, elaborate uh, inscriptions at that time. Well, it depends. You know, you know, the thing is, is that, is that you're, it also depends on another factor. And that is that depends also your your funerary club. So because they have their own internal rules of what they of the, what they want, almost like our, our our memorial parks or cemeteries have certain rules, you know, to make things easier. So, but uh, we still have unique tombs, even the Columbaria. Yeah. So it just depends. It, again, depends on when. Yeah. So. Yeah. Any other any other questions? Nothing from the Zoomers. Nothing. Nothing from the. Uh, nothing from the Zoom group. Yeah. So. Uh, well, uh, any other uh, uh, funerary gods and goddesses that are pretty much unknown to the general modern. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have like you you know various uh, you know Etruscan gods and goddesses that kind of get mixed up into it. Or forms that you're going to see of, of, of Roman versions of it, because they still have that legacy in Rome. Uh, but you're also going to see in the Etruscan tombs, uh, you're going to see a figure known as Dispatch. Uh, Dispatch, he has a gigantic club. Oh, yeah. And the idea is, is that when, when you die, Dispatch, this god of death, clubs you over your head and you die. And so, and that tradition, of course, continues on uh, when it comes to the, the Colosseum, when the gladiators are fighting. And somebody who's is terribly wounded, uh, you know, and you know, they'll, 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 they'll yell dispatch, and the guy will come out and just, you know, knock him out of his misery. So that's part of the Etruscan uh, context there, right? Yeah. yeah. So no, that's interesting. I, I, I read a, a couple of books on gladiators uh, mm -hmm. years ago, and I, they do. There is a reference to a person who comes out colored blue, I think. And it has the big mallet. The big mallet is and dispatch. It's a way of testing whether or not somebody dead or alive. Yeah. You know, a way of checking. That's how you take you out. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, again, also remember the Romans do believe in reincarnation. So, so this is something that was very popular, very well known. And yet we don't know it, yeah, which I think is interesting because we've got to remember uh, that the Aeneid, uh, which was you know, read by school children, mandatory after the time of Augustus when they're eight, nine years of age, includes this idea, a very fervent idea of reincarnation. And we probably, I've, I've told the story quite a few times, but I'll just say it again, is that Aeneas, uh, he wants to know more about his progeny. He wants to know, you know, uh, he, he had left Troy, he went to Carthage, um, and he escaped Carthage, left heartbroken Dido, uh, who fell in love with him uh, and he just escaped because he thought duty was over love, duty over passion. And of course, the last scene of her is uh, her sitting on their, on their, with, you know, their, their, their lovemaking bed and she stabs herself as the flames rise up higher. She's pretty dramatic. Uh, anyway, so what happens is that he arrives in Rome uh, and uh, he wants to find, uh, sorry, arrives in Italy, not Rome. He arrives in Italy, and so he goes to Cume, uh, and uh, he goes and he, he talks to the Sybil, and he's brought into the underworld, and he is taken uh, to the river Styx. Uh, you know, uh, he pays uh, Cerebrus, right? Uh, sorry, 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 pays Charon, excuse me, pays Charon to cross the other side. He faces Cerebrus, the three-headed uh, dog. And he keeps on going and he goes to various levels. We won't go too much into detail, but you have the level of the innocence, you know, we've talked about this before, which are babies of those who were charged of crimes they didn't commit, who are instantly reincarnated. Uh, then, of course, you have the, the level of the suicides. And he does see Queen Dido there for a split second. And she just kind of turns away with averted face. And then uh, the martial fields, the fields of the warriors. Uh, and then, of course, uh, he gets all the way down. Uh, to the great judges, and you have on one side, of course, Elysium, 
this way, Elysium, and, and the other way, of course, Tartarus. But we got to remember that according to the Aeneid, uh, your, your time is up after a thousand years. And, and so, in fact, I have, um, I actually do have something I can read uh, about that from the Aeneid. How's that? I'll actually read it as opposed to me describing it. Why don't we let the Aeneid uh, do it for me? Uh, so what's going to happen uh, is that uh, is that now if you're in Tartarus, you're not so bad. You during that thousand years, you can transfer over to Elysium, and Tartarus is a place known as per, it's known as Purgatoria. Uh, it's a purgation through water and fire to become purified. But at the very end, after a thousand years, everybody is released from the Elysium and from Tartarus, and they are marched towards. Uh, the the place known as Lythe. Lythe is a place of the waters of forgetfulness. And these waters of forgetfulness, once you drink from them, then you are reincarnated. Does that make sense? In the next life. And I'm going to read, This is I love this because whoever put this to poetry did a great job. He says, nor death itself can wholly wash their stains. This is talking about Tartarus. But long contracted filth even in the soul remains. The relics of vice they wear and spots of sin obscene in every face appear. For this are various penances enjoined and some are hung to bleach upon the wind, some plunged in waters, others purged in fires till all the dregs are drained and all the rust expires. All have their manes and those manes bear the few so cleansed to those abodes appear and breathe in ample fields the soft Elysian air. Then are they happy when by a length of time the scurf is worn away of each committed crime. No speck is left of the habitual stains, but the pure ether of the soul remains. But then a thousand rolling years are past, so long their punishments and penances last. Whole droves of minds are, by the driving God, compelled to drink the deep Lethean flood. In large forgetful droughts to steep the cares of their past labors and their irksome years, that unremembering of its former pain, the soul may suffer mortal flesh again. And there it is, right there in the Aeneid. And it goes a little further because uh, his friend, his friend, friend, his father, <laughs> friend, yeah, hopefully it's his friend, his father, and Cassus, uh, says that you can, did you know that your line, Aeneas, is going to be on the line uh, that's going to start the, the, the Roman emperors. It's a line of the Caesars. In fact, I can point out right now their souls drinking from the waters of Lake. And he says, he says, the father says to Aeneas, he says, sorry, my eyes hurt me here, but he says, now fix your sight and stand on tent to see your Roman race and Julian progeny. The mighty Caesar waits his final hour, impatient for the world and gra grasps his promised power. Uh, but next behold, the youth of form divine, Caesar himself exalted in his line Augustus promised oft and long foretold, sent to the realm that Saturn re ruled of old, born to restore a better age of gold. And there you have it. So uh, reincarnation is a very real concept uh, for the Romans. I'm not crying, that's why I get something in my eye. You gotta love that. Okay, there you go. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this idea is in what the, the, the third most uh, important uh, great epic of the ancient world. And so this is a common belief. And you can see that idea and a hope of a, another life, uh, not only in the inscriptions, but even in the iconography. And of course, the symbol of Dionysus and rebirth and butterflies and everything else. Is this helpful? Yeah. yeah, cool. yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Well, any, any idea oh. how Far back that uh, reincarnation belief goes. Yes, I do. 
Uh, in fact, I'm going to be talking about that maybe next time. Uh, oh, I, from India. Yeah, from India. Uh, but I will say that the, the, you know, the idea uh, seems to be first uh, introduced uh, by Pythagoras. So Pythagoras uh, of, of, of Samos uh, believed in reincarnation. And so the Pythagoreans uh, held this viewpoint and this perspective. And then uh, next person who's very important who believed in reincarnation, his name was Plato. And Plato talked at length about this idea. Uh, Empedocles will talk about it, as well as many other of the great philosophers of ancient Greece. And then these ideas naturally go over uh, to the Romans themselves. But also by this point, it's, it's very uh, uh, much part of popular culture and popular belief. The debate is, is, is that whether or not uh, people just simply believe in reincarnation, even without the influence of India. Uh, so that's that's up for debate. But the crystallization of the idea uh, amongst uh, philosophers uh, does seem to have a connection uh, to India. And the reason why is that you have many from India arriving uh, to Greece and Rome. And we know that. We know who they are. We even know their names, which I'll talk about in two weeks. Is that cool? Yeah. And also Alexander the Great also went to India and studied many of those with him also study Indian beliefs. So cool. So that's something that we'll talk about next time. Yeah. Great segue. Okay. All right. If nobody has anything else to ask. Okay. You're released. And have a great night. Released with averted face. Wait, wait, what am I doing? No, wait, no, don't do this. <laughs> Clanking of the bronze. It's like, no. <laughs> I got to throw beans now. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye.